Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. I'm going to talk today about unconscious behavior. So first, let me define what it is. Un by unconscious behavior, I mean behavior that's automatic and occurs with a lack of awareness, conscious will, willpower, intention. So as a result of these uh, effects, we don't really understand what's influencing us, and we often can't avoid the behavior because we don't really know uh, where it's coming from. But I want to stress that I'm not talking about the Freudian unconscious. And the Freudian unconscious was very emotional based and it was hidden from us for motivational reasons. But the new unconscious that neuroscientists and psychologists talk about uh, is, un is, is not accessible by our, by our, to our conscious mind because of where it happens in the brain, because it happens in parts of the brain that are not accessible. So it's by the architecture of the brain that they're unconscious. They're not hidden from us for motivational reasons and they can't be revealed by introspection, by therapy, by talking. But the point really is that the same unconscious processes that we developed as our species was evolving that help us navigate very easily the physical world by uh, being able to process sights and sounds instantaneously and to understand what's going on and what's around us. Uh, similar processes happen in our social unconscious. We have an unconscious that processes social information in, an, in an analogous way that enables us to interact with each other in a very smooth and, and, and instantaneous manner. And this is something that's very important because human, the human species is really, the, uh, in its essence, a social species. We probably couldn't have survived as a species without our social interactions, without banding together in groups. And also we're a very violent species, so it was very important to these groups to know who your friends, who your enemies are, and as in all primates, what the hierarchy is within the group. And so we all have ways of, of not only recognizing and identifying other humans, but also of knowing what they think and knowing what they think about us, knowing what they think we're thinking and so forth. And I want you to come away with a, a couple main points. One is that our perceptions, our, our visual and auditory perceptions, our memories also, and our social judgments and perceptions are all constructed by our mind and largely influenced by our unconscious mind. And they're not direct, literal reflections of what's really out in the world but they're rather a construction of our mind that we believe is real and seems real to us. And uh, some of the things that our unconscious mind uses, in addition to the physical data that's out there, for instance, the data of what someone really says or uh, how a scene really looks, the, the light coming from the scene, in addition to that actual literal data, our mind uses things like our prior knowledge, our beliefs, our desires, the context, and many other things to feed into our conscious mind and form our perception. And that's the root of some of the conscious, some of the um, illusions, optical and cognitive illusions that I'll talk about. Uh, this is what you perceive if you look at a road, right, or, or anywhere you see a, a clear picture. Uh, this is the picture that you think is real. But let me show you the, the data that a physicist would say is actually hitting your retina. So I'm going to show you a picture now that was made to reflect the actual data that, that hits your retina. And that looks like this, uh, except for that yellow area in the center, which is there to indicate where the person was looking. So if you were to really uh, perceive the world around you without your unconscious processing, you'd have a very fuzzy picture. But instead, without your thinking about it, without any uh, uh, effort, your brain puts it together and you feel that what you see is really what's there. Uh, let me illustrate this. I want to illustrate three points here. One is that you're not going to have any control and that your mind does this automatically and that it is using context to, to make this picture. So what you see here is a picture of a checkerboard and you see two two rectangles, one labeled A and one labeled B. And they probably, when you, as you look at that, you, you can see that B is a white square and A is a black square, and B looks to be lighter than A. Okay? But in reality, I'm telling you now, and trust me, but I'm telling you, and I'm telling your conscious minds that A and B are exactly the same. Okay? You can't really see them as being the same because your mind is, 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 is taking the context of the picture and making them look different. And again, this is a good thing, because imagine if you had all of just the physical data coming to your brain, like some computer, and you had to consciously sit down and do the calculation and figure out that it's a checkerboard. That would be really tough and take a long time. Instead, 
you automatically see it this way. Uh, one area of our brain, because we're such social species, is specialized for faces. So you probably recognize this fellow, Barack Obama. And um, the pictures, uh, he, although he's upside down, probably look relatively normal to you. Now, our, since our brains are specialized to recognize faces, because faces are so, so socially important, I want to illustrate the, the, the extra uh, uh, special processing your brain does by flipping this picture over, and you'll see that the faces really aren't really that similar at all, and one is grotesquely deformed. But since your brain is not used to seeing people upside down, this only kicks in when I turn them over. So now you can see uh, that your brain is helping you and saying uh, this Barack Obama on your right is very deformed, but if I flip him back, he's not. So this is something your brain is automatically doing, but it's not doing it for you for upside down people because that hasn't been evolutionary favored for us. <laughs> so let me go on in the, in the remainder of the talk to social perception. So as in vision and hearing, we need to sometimes to make quick assessments in our social world, and our unconscious mind also constructs uh, a social perception of the world around us. Th this is about how your mind fills in pictures of people uh, based not only on the data that you have of the people, but on other things, such as people's appearance. That inspired a professor at Princeton, a psychologist, to, to see if that really works in the real world. And so he took pairs of headshots dozens of candidates before the 2006 elections of gov for governorships and for Senate. And he showed people brief pictures of these pairs of candidates, didn't tell them what they were, what they were looking at, and just asked them to vote for whoever looked more competent. And if they recognized any of them, not to vote. And then he gathered the data on who looked more competent, and he predicted the results of the 2006 elections based solely on the appearance. No political polls, no political science, just on appearance. And the question is, if appearance really matters, he should have been fairly good at this. And if it doesn't matter, he should have been 50-50. And what was his result? He got 70% of the races correct. So that, that is an, uh, a stark illustration of uh, how, what the effect is of candidates' looks. Touch is another of these unconscious effects that, that affect us very much in our social interactions that we don't realize. Uh, these are pictures of four different uh, species of primates. Uh, and all except for the ones in the center there, they spend a lot of uh, time, an hour or two every day, uh, grooming and touching each other. And the reason is that touch is, is used among primates to help uh, create bonds and trust and to form uh, social alliances. And we even have specialized nerves uh, that are concentrated in our face and our forearms that are designed specifically to transmit the, the pleasure of social touch. And they're not really very useful for telling what's touching you or even exactly when. And so the question is, how, how much does touch influence you just as looks influence you and many other things in your environment influence you that I won't have time to talk about? And I'm going to talk about one experiment here, which was done in France. They got some handsome French guys, and they had them stand on a street corner all weekend propositioning single women, single young women who walked by. It's a good job. And, the, and, and to half the women, they gave them a light touch on the elbow or, or the shoulder, less than half a second. As they, as they all read the same text, this is the translation of the text, they gave their name and asked for the woman's phone number. And the question was, when they, when they did this, how much uh, did it, would it increase their success if they included the touch versus just saying what they were going to say? And the answer is it doubled their success rate. So they got 20% phone numbers with the touch, 10% without. Not a grope, just a little light touch. <laughs> now this is, of course, asking for a date is sexually related and so you might think that this doesn't apply in other realms, and I'll give you just a little bit of data because this was done also in many other realms. One of them was in restaurants. If they asked waiters and waitresses to give a little touch to their customers, and then they computed or they um, took data on the tips that the waiters and waitresses got, and they found that it increased their tips from an average of 14.5% to 17% with the touch. And when they were recommending specials and they did the same thing, it increased their number of people who took the special from 40 to 60 percent. So touch and looks are two uh, very important things that your unconscious mind is taking into account to take the context of, of your social perception. And I'm going to end just by showing you how it also works for you, because these are all studies on other people, and it's always more dramatic to do a study of you. So I asked you both, how much did you expect to pay for this hotel room? And uh, um, group one, your average was about 800 pounds. Now, usually I get from group two a little, hmm, and the reason is their average was 160 pounds. You guys were asked first, does this cost more than 3,500 pounds? And group two was asked, does it cost more than 35 pounds? 
And that little, th- you probably think, what an absurd question. This room is not 3,500 pounds, and it's certainly more than 35 pounds. But even this throwaway question that your conscious mind dismisses as being absurd had a great effect on, on what your guess was. Carl Jung said, these subliminal aspects of everything that happened to us may seem to play very little part in our daily lives, but they are the almost invisible roots of our conscious thoughts. Thank you. The book is full of fantastic stuff. And by the way, you have only heard, you know, 5% of what's in this fantastic book, which I would happily pay £85 for. <laughs> um, uh, one of the things that uh, is fascinating is, is the kind of chapter just about this kind of the weird things that we do. And w- what interests me about that is, is I'm, I'm very interested in, in mental illness and the way in which more and more and more things have been classified as mental illness and, and being treated. Now, one of the things you demonstrate in your book is that we all have a tendency to think we're above average. So we all have delusions of, of brilliance, really. 60% of people think we're average or better, and a lot of people you know, think they're in the top 10%. Very, very few people think they're below average. I'm kind of interested in what your study tells us for how it is we c- how, how firmly rooted is the d- distinction we can make between being a well-adjusted human being and one who's got problems that need treatment? Well, I mean, I, I'm well-adjusted and everyone else has problems. That's <laughs> <laughs> um, that is the way most people think, except for depressed people who have the most realistic view of themselves. So it turns out that, that one of the things your unconscious mind does for you is to give you an inflated view of yourself and your abilities and make make um, barriers that come up in front of you and, and, and things you have to overcome seem easier than, than they perhaps objectively would be. And this is, again, a gift to you because it gives us the courage sometimes to, to attack things. So you that know? old kind of critique of me- the idea of mental health, which is it's not actually a measure of sanity, it's a measure of normalcy, is, is kind of right. Yeah, I think so. And, and, you know, there are cases where people have brain abnormalities and it can cause uh, aberrant behavior. For instance, uh, one that I didn't make it into the book uh, was about a a fellow who uh, became a child molester and they found that he had a brain tumor in a certain part of his brain. Uh, He then had it removed. He stopped being a child molester. He was fine for a while. And then after some years, he started being a child molester again and they found that the the tumor had come back. And uh, there have been studies... um, of how your brain chemistry, your brain structure can cause aberrant behavior. People on Parkinson's disease who take uh, certain drugs uh, can become compulsive gamblers, for instance. So our, our brains are physical things that our characters are a reflection of our, of our brains, our structure and the, and the chemistry of your brain. And so from the moral point of view, that's a whole can of worms because well, how do you blame someone for whatever their brain is? And from the clinical point of view, it's also a can of worms because you know, it becomes very fuzzy between what's ideal or normal and what's not. It really should be probably talk about what's socially acceptable Mm -hmm. and what's not and take the morality part out of it. Mm -hmm.